Hey kids, hope you're having a good week. I miss you guys a lot. Um, I'm going to be in uh, meetings all day at the conference, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, record you the next chapter in White Fang so you can uh, listen to that tonight when you're headed for bed. Uh, this is chapter two of the second part of the book, and it's called The Lair. For two days, the she-wolf and one eye hung about the Indian camp. He was worried and apprehensive, yet the camp lured his mate, and she was loath to depart. But when, one morning, the air was rent with the report of a rifle close at hand, and a bullet smashed against a tree trunk several inches from one eye's head, they hesitated no more, but went off for a long, swinging lope that put quick miles between them and the danger. They did not go far, a couple days' journey. The she-wolf's need to find the thing for which she searched had now become imperative. She was getting very heavy and could run but slowly. Once, in the pursuit of a rabbit, which she ordinarily would have caught with ease, she gave over and laid down and rested. One eye came to her, but when he touched her neck gently with his muzzle, she snapped at him with such quick fierceness that he tumbled over backward and cut a ridiculous figure in his effort to escape her teeth. Her temper was now shorter than ever, but he had become more patient than ever and more solicitous. And then she found the thing for which she shot, for which she sought. It was a few miles up a small stream in that summer time that flowed into the Mackenzie, but that was frozen over and frozen down to its rocky bottom, a dead stream of solid white from sorth to the mouth. The she-wolf was trotting wearily along, her mate well in advance, when she came upon the overhanging high clay bank. She turned aside and trotted over to it. The wear and tear of the spring storms and melting snows had underwashed the bank and in one place had made a small cave out of a narrow fissure. She paused at the mouth of the cave and looked the wall over carefully. Then, on one side and the other, she ran along the base of the wall <clears throat> where its abrupt bulk merged from the softer-lined landscape. Returning to the cave, she entered its narrow mouth. For a short three feet she was compelled to crouch, then the walls widened and rose higher in a little round chamber nearly six feet in diameter. The roof barely cleared her head. It was dry and cozy. She inspected it with painstaking care, while one eye, who had returned, stood in the entrance and patiently waited and patiently watched her. She dropped her head with her nose to the ground and directed toward a point near to her closely bunched feet. <clears throat> and around this point she circled several times. Then, with a tired sigh that was almost a grunt, she curled her body in, relaxed her legs, and dropped down her head toward the entrance. One eye, with pointed, interested ears, laughed at her, and beyond outlined against the white light, she could see the brush of his tail waving good-naturedly. Her own ears, with a snuggling movement, lay their sharp points backward and down against the head for a moment, while her mouth opened and her tongue lolled peaceably about, and in this way she expressed that she was pleased and satisfied. <clears throat> One eye was hungry. Though he lay down in the entrance and slept, his sleep was fitful. He kept awaking and cocking his ears at the bright world without, where the April sun was blazing across the snow. When he dozed, upon his ears would steal the faint whispers of hidden trickles of running water, and he would rouse and listen intently. The sun had come back, and all the awakening Northland world was calling to him. Life was stirring. The feel of spring was in the air, the feel of growing life under the snow, of sap ascending in the trees, of buds bursting the shackles of the frost. He anxiously he cast anxious glances at his mate. But she showed no desire to get up. He looked inside, and half a dozen snowbirds fluttered across his field of vision. He started to get up and looked back to his mate again and settled down and dozed. A shrill and minute singing stole upon his heating. Once and twice he sleepily brushed his nose with his paw. Then he woke up. There, buzzing in the air at the tip of his nose, was a lone mosquito. It was a full-grown mosquito, one that had lain frozen in a dry log all winter and that had now been thawed out by the sun. He could resist the call of the world no longer. Besides, he was hungry. He crawled over to his mate and tr tried to persuade her to get up, but she only snarled at him, and he walked out alone into the bright sunshine to find the snow surface soft under his foot and the traveling difficult. He went up the frozen bed of the stream where the snow, shaded by the trees, was yet hard and crystalline. He was gone eight hours, and he came back through the darkness hungrier than when he started. He had found game, but he had not caught it. He had broken through the melting snow crust and wallowed, while the snowshoe rabbits had skimmed along the top lightly as ever. He paused at the mouth of the cave with a sudden shock of suspicion. Faint, strange sounds came from within. 
They were the sounds not made by his mate, and yet they were remotely familiar. He bellied cautiously inside and was met by a warning snarl from the she-wolf. This was received without perturbation, <clears throat> though he obeyed it by keeping his distance. But he remained interested in the other sounds, faint, muffled sobbings and slubberings. His mate warned him irritably away, and he curled up and slept in the entrance. When the morning came and a dim light pervaded the lair, he again sought after the sort of the remotely familiar sounds. There was a new note in his mate's warning snarl. It was a jealous note, and he was very careful in keeping a respectful distance. Nevertheless, he made out, sheltering between her legs against the length of her body, five strange little bundles of life, very feeble, very helpless, making tiny whimpering noises with eyes that did not open to the light. He was surprised. It was not the first time in his long and successful life that this thing had happened. It had happened many times, yet each time it was as fresh as a surprise to him as ever. His mate looked at him anxiously. Every little while she emitted a low growl, and at times, when it seemed to her he approached too near, the growl shot up in her throat to a sharp snarl. Of her own experience, she had no memory of the thing happening, but in her instinct, which was the experience of all the mothers of wolves, there lurked a memory of fathers that had eaten their newborn and helpless progeny. It manifested itself as a fear strong within her that made her prevent one eye from more closely inspecting the cubs he had fathered. But there was no danger. Old One Eye was feeling the urge of an impulse that was, in turn, an instinct that had come down to him from all the fathers of wolves. He did not question it nor puzzle over it. It was there in the fiber of his being. It was the most natural thing in the world that he should obey it by turning his back on his newborn family and trotting out in the way on the meat trail whereby he lived. Five or six miles from the lair, the stream divided, its forks going off among the mountains at a right angle. There, leading up the left fork, he came upon a fresh track. He smelled it and found it so recent that he crouched swiftly and looked in the direction which it disappeared. Then he turned deliberately and took the right fork. The footprint was much larger than the one his own feet made, and he knew that in the wake of such a trail there was little meat for him. Half a mile up the right fork, his quick ears caught the sound of, a, of gnawing teeth. <clears throat> he stalked the quarry and found it to be a porcupine, standing upright against a tree and, and trying its teeth on the bark. One eye approached carefully, but hopelessly. He knew the breed, though he had never met it so far north before, and never in his long life had porcupine served him for a meal. <clears throat> but he had long since learned that there was such a thing as chance or opportunity, and he continued to draw near. There was never any telling what might happen. For living things, <clears throat> for with live things, events were somehow always happening differently. The porcupine rolled itself into a ball, radiating long, sharp needles in all directions that defied attack. In his youth, one eye had once sniffed too near a, sim a similar and apparently inert ball of quills, and had the tail flick out suddenly in his face. One quill had carried away in his muzzle, where it had remained for weeks, a rankling flame until it finally worked out. So he lay down in a comfortable crouching position, his nose fully a foot away, and out of the line of the tail. Thus he waited, keeping perfectly quiet. There was no telling. Something might happen. The porcupine might unroll. There might be an opportunity for a depth and ripping thrust of a paw into the tender, unguarded belly. But at the end of half an hour he arose, growled wrathfully at the motionless ball, and trotted on. He had waited too often and futilely in the past for porcupines to unroll, to waste any more time. He continued up the right fork. The day wore along, and nothing rewarded his hunt. The urge of his awakened instinct of fatherhood was strong upon him. He must find meat. In the afternoon he blundered upon a ptarmigan. It came out of a thick of it and <clears throat> found himself face to face with the slow-witted bird. It was sitting on a log, not a foot beyond the end of his nose. Each saw the other. The bird made a startling rise, but he stuck it with his paw and smashed it down to earth, then pounced on it and caught it in his teeth as it scuttled across the snow, trying to rise in the air again. <clears throat> as his teeth crunched through the tender flesh and fragile bones, he began naturally to eat. Then he remembered, and turning on the back track, started for home, carrying the ptarmigan in his mouth. <clears throat> a mile above the forks, running velvet-footed as was his custom, a gliding shadow that cautiously prospected East New Vista of a trail, he came upon later imprints of the large tracks he had discovered in the early morning. As the tracks led his way, he followed, prepared to meet the maker of it at every turn of the stream. He slid his head around the corner of a rock, where began an unusually large bend in the stream, and his quick eyes made out something that sent him crouch swiftly down. It was the maker of the track, a large female lynx. <clears throat> she was crouching, as he had crouched once that day, in front of her the tight-rolled ball of quills. 
If he had been a gliding shadow before, he now became the ghost of such a shadow, as he crept and circled around, and came up well to the leeward of the silent, motionless pair. He lay down in the snow, depositing the ptarmigan beside him, and with eyes peering through the needles of low-growing spruce, he watched the play of life before him, the waiting lynx and the waiting porcupine, each intent on life, such was the curiousness of the game. The way of life for one lay in eating the other, and the way of life for the other lay in not being eaten. While old one eye, the wolf crouching in the convert in the covert, played his part too in the game, waiting for some strange freak of chance that might help him on the meat trail, which was his way of life. Half an hour passed, an hour, nothing happened. The ball of quills might have been a stone for all it moved. The lynx might have been frozen to marble, and old one eye might have been dead. Yet all three animals were keyed to a tenseness of living that was almost painful, and scarcely ever would it come to them to be more alive than they were then in their seeming petrification. One eye moved slightly and peered forth with increased eagerness. Something was happening. The porcupine had at last decided that its enemy had gone away. Slowly, cautiously, it was unrolling its ball of impregnable armor. It was agitated by no tremor of anticipation. Slowly, slowly, the bristling ball straightened out and lengthened. One eye watched, felt a sudden moistness in his mouth and drooling of saliva, involuntarily excited by the living meat that was spreading itself like a repast before him. Not quite entirely had the porcupine unrolled when it discovered its enemy. In that instance, the lynx struck. The blow was like a flash of light. The paw, with rigid claws curved like talons, shot under the belly and came back with a swift, ripping movement. Had the porcupine been entirely unrolled, or had it not discovered its enemy a fraction of a second before the blow was struck, the paw would have escaped unscathed. But a side flick of the tail shank, sank sharp quills into it as it was withdrawn. Everything happened at once. The blow, the counter blow, the squeal of agony from the porcupine, the big cat's squall of sudden hurt and astonishment. One eye half arose in his excitement, his ears up, his tail straightened out and quivering behind him. The lynx's bad temper got the best of her. She sprang savagely at the thing that had hurt her. But the porcupine, squealing and grunting, with disrupted anatomy trying feebly to roll into its ball of protection, flicked out its tail again, and again the big cat squalled with hurt and astonishment. Then she fell back away, and sneezing, her nose bristled, bristling with quills like a monstrous pincushion. She brushed her nose with her paws, trying to dislodge the fiery darts, thrust it into the snow, and rubbed it against twigs and branches, and all the time leaping about, a head sideways up and down in a frenzy of pain and fright. She sneezed continually, and her stub of a tail was doing its best toward lashing about by giving quick, violent jerks. She quit her antics and quieted down for a long minute, when I watched, and even he could not repress a start and an involuntary bursting of hair along its back when she suddenly leaped without warning straight up in the air at the same time emitting a long and most terrible squall. Then she sprang away up the trail, squalling with every leap she made. It was not until her racket had faded away in the distance and died out that one eye ventured forth. He walked as delicately as though all the snow were carpeted with porcupine quills, erect and ready to pierce the soft pads of his feet. The porcupine met his approach with a furious squealing and a clash of his long teeth. It had managed to roll up in a ball again, but it was not quite the old compact ball. Its muscles were much too torn for that. It had been ripped almost in half and was still bleeding profusely. One eye scooped out mouthfuls of the blood-soaked snow and chewed and tasted and swallowed. This served as relish, and his hunger increased mightily. But he was too old in the world to forget his caution. He waited. He lay down and waited while the poor pupine grated its teeth and uttered grunts and sobs and the occasional sharp little squeals. In a little while, one eye noticed that the quills were drooping and the great quivering had set up. The quivering came to an end suddenly. There was a final defiant clash of long teeth, then all the quills drooped quite down and the body relaxed and moved no more. With a nervous shrinking paw, one eye stretched out the porcupine to its full length and turned it over on its back. Nothing had happened. It was surely dead. He studied it intently for a moment, then took a careful grip with his teeth and started off down the stream, partly carrying, partly dragging the porcupine, with the head turned to side so as to avoid stepping on the prickly mass. He recollected something, dropped the burden, and trotted back to where he had left the ptarmigan. He did not hesitate a moment. He knew clearly what was to be done, and he did by promptly eating the ptarmigan. Then he returned and took up his burden. When he dragged the result of the day's hunt to the cave, the she-wolf inspected it, turned her muzzle to him, and lightly licked him on the neck. But the next instant she was warning him away from the cubs with a snarl that was less harsh than usual and more apologetic than menacing. Her instinctive fear of the father of her progeny was toning down. He was behaving as a wolf father should, and manifesting no unholy desire to devour the young ones she had brought into the world. 
And that, guys, is the end of chapter two. I love you both very much, and I hope you sleep well, and I will see you Thursday night, late, 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 when I return.